one year after FDR confiscated everyone's gold with the Executive Order 6102 in 1933, he announced another order regarding silver. The Executive Order 6814 was the exact same order as the previous, even with the same penalties, which were a $10,000 fine, 10 years imprisonment, or both. I'm sure most of you never even knew he also confiscated our silver the year after and shows how vulnerable we truly are, especially once you hear this unsettling information that I just uncovered. <laughs> Welcome back, my friends. Thank you so much for tuning in. This is Silver Slayer, the channel that brings you silver videos every single day of the week. So make sure you subscribe and click the bell so you're always kept in the loop. When we're talking about silver confiscation, a lot of people just write it off immediately. But this has happened before. A lot of people don't even know this. They just think about the Executive Order 6102 by FDR in 1933, but in 1934, the exact same order was pushed, just Executive Order 6814, requiring the delivery of all silver to the United States for coinage. Now, if this were to happen nowadays, which is the possibility of it happening, it wouldn't be for coinage, in my opinion, even though... Uh, we did just bring back the gold standard to some extent. I think there's four states right now that have brought it back. You can use silver to pay off debts. I think there's like 20-something states that are signed up for it. But regardless, I would be looking at it from more of a fundamentally uh, type of perspective when we're looking at the supply deficit, hundreds of millions of ounces in the red, how we need much more silver than we actually have to achieve this zero net emissions by the year 2050 as we try to go green. I think it would, it would be more of that angle if we were to have our silver confiscated. Mining innovation, I don't know if that's enough. Recycling, I don't know if that's enough. Where else are we going to get it from? Space mining isn't realistically going to happen for another few decades in my opinion. Um, but anyways, I wanted to talk about this because I did find an interesting article that really is something everyone should be aware of. I wanted to first give a recap on this executive order. Um, so anyways, by virtue of authority vested in me by the Silver Purchase Act of 1934 and all of the authority vested in me, I, Franklin D. Roosevelt, President of the United States of America, do hereby require the delivery of all silver situated in the continental United States on the effective date hereof by any and all persons owning, possessing, or controlling any such silver, and do hereby require any and all persons owning, possessing, or controlling any such silver to deliver the same in the manner upon the conditions and subject to the exceptions herein contained, such action being in my judgment necessary to effectuate the policy of the Silver Purchase Act of 1934. Section 2. Silver required to be delivered. There shall be delivered in accordance with the terms of this order all silver situated in the continental United States on the effective day hereof, except silver falling within any of the following categories so long as it continues to fall thereunder. A. Silver coins, whether foreign or domestic, which foreign is very interesting and important to note because we've talked about silver confiscation in the past and would they require uh, coins minted in other countries such as pandas or Britannias or maple leaves and it's interesting to see and note that it was more than just U.S. legal tender. B. Silver of a fineness of 0.8 or less, which has not entered into industrial, commercial, professional, artistic, or monetary use. This C section is very, very thorough, and I'm not going to cover all of it because it's just a lot, and I mean a lot, packed in to one section. They're talking about um, silver mined after December 21st, 1933 from natural deposits. Um, then they go into so much silver mined in the continental United States 
or or on or before the effective date of this order, which shall not have been deposited with the United States Mint tender of the proclamation. And they go into like 75 days of the effective date and greater than 0.8 after. You see what I'm saying? It's just a lot. It's a lot. So D, silver held for industrial, professional, or artistic use and unmelted scrap silver and silver sweepings in an amount not exceeding in the aggregate 500 fine troy ounces belonging to any one person e silver owned on the effective date hereof by a recognized foreign government foreign central bank or the bank of or for international settlements this is a very very specific order uh, and I want you guys to comment down below. If an order like this was pushed today, would you turn in your silver? Would you risk that penalty, possibly imprisonment? Which, by the way, ten thousand dollars back in 1934 is half a million dollars today, a couple hundred thousand at least. But regardless, F which is silver contained in articles fabricated and held in good faith for a specific and customary use and not for their value of, as a silver bullion coin or silver held under a license issued in accordance with Section 6 hereof. There's a lot. I'm not going to cover all this. We're going to go into the actual article um, because this is this is the meat and potatoes. This is the article I found which made me make this video, but I wanted to just highlight some of that order and how it's happened before. Ironically, this article doesn't even talk about that order. It is mentioning silver, though, and it's from uh, silverbullion.org. The article's titled, Why That's Just Plain Stealing, Isn't It, Mr. President? So it's going over this, and they bring up some very good points, and I think you guys, a lot of you guys actually are going to get some important information out of this because it talks about some very, very serious and unsettling stuff that I never even really thought about in terms of gold and silver confiscation to this angle. So let's jump into this. Hong Kong is 8,000 miles from the United States. But that did not stop the U.S. government from disallowing U.S. banks from transacting with 11 Hong Kong officials it sanctioned. Hong Kong Chief Executive Carrie Lam acknowledged in August that the sanctions had caused her some inconvenience with using her credit cards. And Andy has talked about this, by the way. As for myself, of course, it will have a little bit of inconvenience here and there because we have to use some financial services and we don't know whether that will relate back to an agency that has some American business and the use of credit cards is sort of hampered, she said in an interview. Her remarks in bold underscored how businesses with the U.S. exposure are more likely to comply with U.S. government sanctions. One has to consider then if these companies would risk billions of revenue for the sake of a minority of sanctioned clients. So here is the important part that I wanted to talk about. So this is the impact of jurisdictional exposure on your bullion holdings. We have always warned against storing gold and silver with banks and vault operators with exposure to the U.S. or within jurisdictions with unsustainable debt growth. Strategies to protect one's wealth in precious metals have to go beyond merely trusting a well-known global company or the much touted advantages of the jurisdictional diversification. Remember, folks, what is the saying that I always talk about? If you can't hold it, you don't own it. There is, theoretically, they say, 250 other people on the COMEX that own the same exact ounce that you're holding in your bare hands. They think they own that ounce. They think that ounce is sitting in a vault somewhere with their name on it, but it's not. There is not a one-to-one -one leverage of silver stored online and physically, which they are 
um, which they are portraying it to be. It's a facade. It is corruption at its finest. It's also why silver is extremely undervalued, and the COMEX will collapse someday. And when it does, silver's true value will uh, get exposed. But until then, make sure you are in control of your wealth. So um, whatever advantages a jurisdiction may have become ineffective if your vault operator indemnifies itself against foreign governments nationalizing the stored gold or silver. This is where things get very scary. Force majeure clauses in most vaulting agreements are designed to protect vault operators from lawsuits by their clients in the event of gold nationalization or confiscation by any government. In this case, it makes little difference whether the gold is stored in Singapore, Switzerland, or the United States. Here's an example of a typical force majeure clause that you should pay attention to when scrutinizing a vault operator's insurance of terms or terms of conditions. Here's the vault shall not be liable under any circumstances whatsoever for shortage of mysterious disappearance or unexplained loss from or damage to the goods said to be contained in a parcel. Did you hear what that just said? It's not their fault. If there's a shortage or mysterious disappearance or unexplained loss, it's not their fault. If your gold or silver that has your name on it in a vault just myster- and I like how they use the word mysteriously disappears, that is scary. Most dealers who offer storage programs are clueless about such risks or do not believe gold confiscation by governments will happen again. Many cite that the U.S. 1933 gold confiscation occurred because the U.S. was on a gold standard then and the government needed gold to expand the money supply. They believe that governments today, freed from the constraints of a gold standard, would be more inclined to raise taxes or raid pension funds than to confiscate gold. We disagree, and we believe the chances for bankrupt governments to grab citizens' gold are much higher today. And yeah, I mean, we determine a country's wealth on how much gold we have, basically. And if we're talking about every time they confiscate people's gold, time and time and time again throughout history, not just the United States, but all over the world, um, I've made videos showing or talking about every single time they've confiscated people's gold. It's always in times of war or economic turmoil, right? Financial turmoil. And we are experiencing both of those to a very serious degree right now. So um, this part talks about if the government will confiscate gold. It is impossible to predict with certainty what actions a government might take in the future. And it's also impossible to predict what circumstances are going to happen that would make them decide if that action is Um, you know, the right case or not, right? So many unknown variables. In the past, some governments have confiscated gold holdings while others have not. The likelihood of gold confiscation depends on various political, economic, and social factors that are specific to each country. Um, So this is interesting. Governments may choose to confiscate gold in order to have control over the country's gold reserves and use the metal as a means of financing government operations particularly during times of war or economic crisis. Like I was mentioning, war, economic turmoil, financial turmoil, the two, things, the two times uh, that you know, a country is experiencing where they confiscate people's gold, like I just mentioned. Well, I also made a video a couple weeks ago, a very controversial video from the pickaxe, uh, talking about how U.S. military raids um, are silver stockpiles. And... That's not that crazy to think when you realize how much silver is needed. I mean, 500 ounces of silver in a single Tomahawk missile. Just think about electronics and all the, the industrial side for silver. And if we're already experiencing a silver shortage, it wouldn't be that crazy to think that they would do that. But anyways, it this kind of it even more validates why it would be more possible or more likely nowadays than not, given the financial crisis and the wars we're in. 
So gold confiscation also may occur as a means of controlling inflation or stabilizing the currency. So they go into um, the Executive Order 6102. Oh, they do mention the... Oh, no, they just talk about the Gold Reserve Act of 1934. I don't know why they wouldn't mention the Executive Order 6814 as well, since, you know, that... Where's it at? Um... Um, it's somewhere over here, but um, there's a wiki page on the Executive Order 6814 as well to give some interesting points. But um, this, l let's wrap this part up. And here's an interesting uh, thing from a newspaper, Britain off the gold standard, um, talking about stock exchange close, but banks open as usual, built through both houses of parliament today. So what is the real reason for the gold confiscation? It is time we awake the real reason why highly indebted governments are likely to confiscate gold. They want the confidence that gold gives, right? We don't determine a country's wealth off how much dollar bills they print. How many dollar bills they print, we determine it off of gold. So... Germany's hyperinflation in the 1920s destroyed its currency, right? Trust was only restored with the introduction of gold-backed currency, the gold mark. So since we're talking about all of this, it's very important to understand this part. Protecting one's wealth has never been more critical. Silver bullion maximizes or minimizes counterparty and jurisdictional risks to customers' wealth. We only store precious metals exclusively within Singapore. Not okay. Obliged to. Okay. Well, they're mentioning that. I'm not going to mention that. But uh, it is interesting at the very, very end he finally talks about silver because this entire article was all talking about gold confiscation. And then at the very end he just throws in why silver is extremely important. So um yeah that's that's what's uh, you know, what I think should be uh, taken very seriously if you are someone who isn't in direct control of your precious metals, then you might want to do so. And if you're someone who thinks that gold and silver confiscation is just some fairy tale that would never happen again, you might want to reanalyze the possibility because it is a lot more likely than I think people acknowledge, especially given why in the past they have confiscated people's gold and silver. So yeah, anyways, um, I'm going to wrap this video up here. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, make sure to like the video. Make sure you subscribe because I do post daily silver-related videos, um, and you'll never miss a beat. I cover everything. Thanks for tuning in. This is Silver Slayer. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Peace.